Hi, I'm Laura Patterson, president of Vision Edge Marketing. And since 1999, we have focused on helping our customers use data analytics, process and measurement to drive growth, create value and improve performance. We're among the foremost authorities and one of the pioneers of marketing performance management and the underwriters of the Marketing Performance Management Annual Benchmark Study. It's a great pleasure to be here and you can always find us at visionedgemarketing.com. Uh, hi, I'm Guy Powell and I'm the founder of Pro Relevant and we provide uh, to major uh, advertisers around the world marketing analytics and consulting services to help them make significantly better strategic and tactical marketing decisions so that they can drive more profit, revenue, and market share. You can reach us at uh, ProRelevant.com. Thank you. Hi, this is Mathieu from the Marketing. Just very pleased that I uh, finished my book and uh, happy to discuss it with uh, Laura and Guy. I'm working on uh, the accountability of marketing with a couple of companies to make sure that the marketeers are proud or get them back in the boardroom again so they get a hold of their, uh, their budget and their activities and they are really driving the value of the company. You can reach me at accountablemarketing.expert. Hi guys, it's great to have you here. It's Michiel van der Watering at accountablemarketing.expert. I'm here with Laura Patterson of Vision Edge Marketing and uh, Guy Powell of Pro Relevant. And I'm very pleased to have them here uh, on the short uh, webinar. And I'm very pleased because I just finished my, uh, my book and I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Laura. And after that, we will have a short interview by, uh, by Guy Powell. So take it away, guys. Here you are, uh, Laura. Thank you for this copy. I am so excited to have it. Congratulations, Mikel, on your book. Thank you yeah, so much, congratulations. congratulations for certain, Mikhail. It's a uh, it's a great uh, thing to get a book done. I've uh, written a couple myself, and I think Laura has as well, and done a lot of writing. And it's yeah. always a challenge to get everything done. That's for sure. So what we thought today, what we would do is uh, is uh, I will be the interviewer, and I'm going to ask Mikhail and uh, Laura a handful of questions and try and get at some of the key elements that are in the book and some of the philosophies that are in there. So let me just start with the first question. And uh, Laura, why don't you take this one? And that is, uh, what do you see as the main challenge for marketers when it comes to the accountability of marketing? The that is a big question, and if you, and I know with you guys keeping a pulse on this space, you've probably seen some of the recent articles that have come out from Forrester and Gartner and Forbes and other places, all talking about, boy, we still haven't cracked the nut on this challenge yet. And it's not a new problem, right? I mean, we've been around since 1999. Guy, I think maybe as long, right? I mean, we've been talking about this together for almost 20 years, amazingly, mm -hmm. and yeah. it, and it, and uh, so why why does it seem so so challenging? And I think it has a lot to do. Um, we have more data today than ever before, and people are more involved in looking at the numbers than ever before. But maybe they've got lost sight of what it is they're supposed to be looking at and what they're supposed to be doing with that data. So I think that may be where the challenge lies. More than it is in having the data, I don't think anyone has a data problem anymore. And I, I know, I hear it all the time. We have so much data, we just can't manage all of it. So we've gone from like part, a scarcity of data, right, to a plethora of data in a couple of decades. We have more technology than ever. We have more analytics capabilities than ever and we're still struggling to be able to show the contribution marketing makes to the business. So I'm so glad we're talking about that. Yeah, that's definitely an issue. Uh, certainly uh, the data uh, environment and the data background and foundations have all changed over the last couple of years. Mikhail, any thoughts on that? Well, I look at an uh, organizational point of view where I can see it every now and then, it's quite a hustle for marketeers to get the hands together of the C-suite or or their bosses to invest in the accountability of, of uh, marketing, to invest in the right data, collecting the right data, doing some research, um, buying even the data if you need, building models. I even had a client who said to me, buy bother material, I would like to invest in another uh, advertising in, the, in a newspaper. 
and I said, okay, but in a couple of years, a uh, couple of, sorry, a couple of months, you would like me to have a better plan than I have now. So I need to invest in investigating the right measurements for the marketing activities in order to improve our plan. And then he understood. He said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's a, a very good point is making sure that the uh, the plan is uh, is is also not only executable once, but can be improved upon as, as time moves forward, as you want to repeat your right. investment in marketing. I, I, I echo that. I think Mikhail's right. And, you know, I think it all starts with the plan or the lack thereof. Most of the time, what we see in marketing plans is really just a list of things they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and how much they're going to expend, and maybe what they think the return on that spend is going to be. But that's not really a marketing plan, right? A marketing plan it should be much more strategic in nature. It should be, uh, uh, it needs to be measurable. In, uh, beyond just these very specific things at an activity level, it needs to be looking more at the big picture and in terms of what it's going to do and uh, to move the needles for the business forward. And that means it needs to be really tightly aligned to the business. Um, and oftentimes we don't we don't really see that. So I think that's a really important point that Mikhail's making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, then uh, let's uh, maybe jump over to the next question. So, uh, Mikhail, this one I'll start with you. Is uh, is uh, the question is accountability only for large companies and multinationals? Well, if you look at the budgets of large companies, they have uh, like a, a Unilever, Procter and Gamble. They have a couple of billions uh, in dollars for a marketing budget, so they have a lot of millions of dollars to spend on the accountability of marketing. So that's easy. But if you're a small company, uh, maybe just uh, the butcher around the corner, um, you can also invest in the accountability of marketing. You just have to see what your advertising uh, activities are and see whether they work or not. So it's also for small companies. But yes, it's easier if you've got a couple of million to invest in this so you can make a whole accountability organization uh, than when you're a small company. But both you can do it and you can build your own model. It doesn't have to cost that much if you're a small company. You just set out your uh, your goals. Um, you don't know them at forehand, but the next time you're going to set your goals, you know better because you have measured the results of the, the former campaign. So you increase your, uh, your uh, results over and over again. So I think certainly it's for small companies as well. Otherwise, it's still a waste of your marketing budget if you don't measure. Yeah, I, love that, this, I love this question. And the reason I'm smiling is we have a, um, a commercial series running over here in the States with an insurance advisor and he's talking to individuals. And one of the, in one of the episodes in the, in the series, the, one of the folks says, well, I only have X number of dollars. That's probably not that many dollars for you to consider investing. And the, the investor, the, the advisor says, well, it's a lot of money to you, right? And to that person, it's a lot of money to them and it means everything. So I often talk about, and I know people have heard me say this, that as marketers, the company is giving us money to invest on its behalf, regardless of the mm -hmm. size. And yeah. our, right, regardless, whether you're big or small, and we need to be able to show what we have done with that money on behalf of the organization. If we were a small investor or a large investor, it makes no difference what we expect from our investment advisor. So why should that be any different based on size? The, the difference may be uh, the choices we make and how many different things we can invest in. Uh, so that may, you know, if you have large portfolio, you may be able to do more, let's make this up, single stock investments. But if you're a small person, an investor, you might need to think more around funds, right? And you don't want to eat up a lot of your money in, in, in um, administrative costs when you're small. You want as much of your money to go as possible to the investments that you're making. So there's all different kinds of things you would think about based on your size, but you'd still want to know that the, organ that the advisor is responsibly investing and can report back to you on what they did with your money. So large or small, I don't think makes a difference for our company. Right. Well, and just to add one uh, thing to that, uh, when it's a small company, it's it's my money. <laughs> when it's a big company, <laughs> yeah. it's often that's it's the case for somebody's money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah those are uh, that's really great. Uh, Mikhail, anything else to add to that? 
No, fine with it. That's, that's just how it is. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, next question. So what is the ROI of bring modeling marketing activities? And Laura, why don't you uh, take a first stab at this one? I'll start that thing that I really, this part of the conversation, but I think this is a really great question for Mikael. So uh, obviously carrying on from this with my last sort of thinking, uh, we do need to be able to show the value of and return of the work that we do in marketing. Uh, and I think that this book is helping marketers understand how important it is for them to have really good financial management. And ROI falls into that category. But we have a lot of conversations with CFOs and CEOs of companies of all sizes in all industries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working with us, we're predominantly B2B, Vision Edge Marketing is. And we predominantly work in five segments, uh, manufacturing, technology, financial services, medical devices, and logistics. So pretty broad. And we work all over the world. And in all of our conversations with companies and CFOs and CEOs in those broad markets, uh, we often hear the CFO and the CEO saying something slightly different than what we hear a CMO or a VP of marketing say. So when we're talking to the CMO and the VP of marketing, they talk about financial management and ROI. Perfect starting point here. But when we talk with the CFO and the CEO, they're actually looking for something bigger. They want to know that how marketing is going to help drive growth for the business, create value for customers, and improve performance of both marketing and the company. And so that's really around something broader than just ROI. There's still performance management implications. There's still financial implications, but they're thinking in a different way. And so I think you've got to be financially, uh, financial management, you know, strong, but you also have to be performance management strong too. Yeah, Mikhail, what do you think? Uh, tell us about the... Uh, what I think I it's, it's a, yeah, it's true. It's not all about uh, the financial point. It's also about uh, being proud again as a marketeer. I once met a, a brand manager of a, a beer mark and, uh, uh, sorry, beer brand, and he was, uh, yeah, he was a bit fed up that he was teased by his colleagues because he couldn't prove what he was doing in building the brand. So with being accountable back again, he was able to show his colleagues, his peer and managers, uh, managing level, that uh, the investments he was doing in the brand and the investment they were doing in marketing, um, that really showed up. And so it was more than a return on investment. It was also being back proud again about the marketing activities, the branding strategy that they were working on. And it's also a matter of what we call getting back into the boardroom so that you're able to show what your money is worth. And what we see in a lot of companies is you build your marketing plan somewhere in November. It's agreed upon in December, including the budget. And then somewhere in May, April, I don't know exactly for sure, but maybe in May, April, they take away some budget because you don't know how to show the management that it's not a right way to, to take away some marketing budget. Because if you can prove what you're doing and say, okay, you take away marketing budget, so also we have to decrease the goals that we have with this company. Because if you're not investing in our plan, then we have then we are facing a problem. So it's not about only about financial. Yeah. No, yeah. I totally agree. Proving value, right? Proving the value. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And and I think that's a great point about you know marketers feeling better um, about being able to show what they're making a difference because we all are coming to work every day. We want to know that we're making a difference, that we're giving value for our, in exchange for our energy and our time. You know, I, I always tell my people the two most precious assets they have are time and energy, neither of which is storable or replaceable, right? So you want to make sure you're investing it well. Uh, and everyone in marketing wants to be able to do that. And I think you're bringing up an, another really important point. And I think you touch on it in this book. And that's about the culture of the organization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's really important. Um, and that's an interesting question. You guys know that we've been doing this NPM marketing performance management benchmark study yeah. since 2001. We've mm -hmm. talked about that before. And you've always supported us in that work. So thank you. And we now know, have pretty good data after all these years, what separates those best-in-class marketers from the rest, what they do differently. 
But an interesting question came up recently um, towards the tail end of last year and is one of the reasons we're kind of thinking through what we want to do about that for this year's study. And that is, okay, we've got this group of marketers, one in four, one in five marketing organizations that can do these things well. And one of those things being accountability, to Mikhail's point. Mm -hmm. but, and we know, and, and we're a little alarmed at the number of marketing organizations that are starting to get pretty low marks in doing it well. The season D's, I mean, that's almost up to 40% now. So it's been on the rise, steadily in, in climbing. Here we are with all this new technology, analytics and data, and the number of marketers earning lower marks is actually increasing. So that's a little mm -hmm. unsettling. And so one of the questions is, is there something different about the, their organizations? And mm -hmm. I think that is an important question. We're gonna try to tease that out. And I do think you touch on that a little bit in this book, and, and I think that's a really important thing to, to call out. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, um, let's go to the next question. So, uh, uh, Mikhail, what is the difference in accountable off and online marketing? Well, one thing is that for the online uh, accountability, it's quite easy because every click is registered. So you have much more data uh, without doing too much effort. And for the offline, of course, you have to, uh, to put in some extra effort to do research on, like, for instance, what does your television commercial do? What does your out of office, uh, uh, sorry, out of home uh, commercials do? Uh, you have to put in more, much more effort. But for me, the difference between online and offline is sometimes too big or too large within certain companies. For me, it's all about marketing, and it doesn't matter if it's on or offline, uh, because like if you're looking at television commercials, they're also shown on YouTube. Um, so why why make a difference? You need to know what your commercial is doing. And of course, you need to know in which environment it shows up. Um, so for online, you have a lot of data almost for free. And for offline, you have to gather some data and invest in it. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, Laura, so uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I think he's right. But, uh, you know, one of the problems is, though, there's the halo effects between uh, on and offline media. So sometimes those direct measurements that you get out of online don't necessarily tell the whole story. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I would agree. And, you know, we I'm going to defer to you guys because you guys tend to look more at it from a campaign and activity perspective. We tend to look at things much more holistically and strategically. I am a huge uh, proponent of integrated marketing. And when you do integrated marketing, you everything is kind of interwoven together. And so you got to be careful because otherwise, you you know, this is where this whole attribution thing is starting to come in. Where does it come from? But to your point, mm -hmm. Guy, you can't really sometimes tease that out specifically. Um, so I, for example, I might get ultimately last touch from an in-person event. And mm -hmm. that might actually lead to the ultimate customer engagement. But there could have been lots of things prior to that, right? Before that in-person contact, we might have they might have been on LinkedIn and read some articles or some other articles in an online or offline publication. They might have come to our website and, and looked at some stuff, downloaded it on our YouTube channel. They they might be in places we can see them or be in places where we can't see them. But the fact that they made a point at this to it at this in-person event to step up and raise their hand, but there could have been lots and lots of other things that were happening that brought them to that moment. And that moment was sort of the tipping point for them to have a conversation. After that, you know, we might have some emails directly with each other, and then that might lead to them looking at some very specific information or wanting to talk to a customer. And then that might lead back to another conversation. So it's all highly integrated. And I think it's, um, important not to lose sight of how important that is in marketing. And this is why I miss those of us who were integrated marketers in the old days. Remember, we were all integrated marketers in the old days. We became sort of specialists more recently. And I think we need to revisit that 
as a skill set for marketing people, it's not really you're good at social and you're good at events and you're good at online media, but really how do you look at what you're trying to do, which is engage customers, right? Holistically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, you know that that your concept uh, or your your point about integrated marketing and, and looking at it a, at a, at a uh, you know a strategic holistic view it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, any uh, final words on that? Yeah, if you look at integrated marketing management, you really have to look in the, the cooperation between marketing, sales, and what I call service when the customer has passed the deal and his customer. Um, you still have to look into if you're if you're getting the right customer. So marketing and sales can be very happy, and you see in a lot of presentations the funnel stops at the deal after sales, but I think the funnel continues afterwards at what we call service, and you have to be sure that you're picking up the right customers. Otherwise, marketing and sales are quite happy, quite pleased what they're doing. They have a high conversion, they reach a lot of people, and have a lot of deals. But maybe we, we connect, or, or sorry maybe we attract the wrong customers and that's the way that's why you need to cooperate with sales and service to be sure that you're uh, attracting the right customers yeah. I, I, I agree I, I love something that Mikhail does in the book and we've been talking about it a long time too so it's always great to see a kindred spirit and that is about flipping the funnel from a vertical to a horizontal picture and we have discussed that forever we call it pipeline yeah. engineering, but today it's called the customer journey. But the point being that if you flip it, you also have to think about it from the customer, if you're customer centric, from customer behaviors. Mm -hmm. And we we call that the six C's. So for us, we talk about, you gotta make contact. You can, a bunch of stuff is happening over here, out there in the, in the world, digital or not. And ultimately, you need to make contact. You know, it's like someone saying, hello, I am so-and-so, and I work at such and such a place and whatnot. Kind of that old days, the exchange of just a business card. And then from contact, you kind of make a connection, get connected on LinkedIn, maybe they subscribe to your newsletter, the behavioral things. And then from that connection, the goal ultimately, right, is some kind of conversation. And from conversation to some kind of consideration, and consideration being, it could be an RFP, whatever, to consumption where they actually place a purchase order or do an engagement. And then the last C to what Mikel is talking about, community. Those customers that mm -hmm. become a community, how do you make sure they you continue to retain them, they become advocates, you grow your share of wallet with them, they help you to find your next products, they adopt those new products, they're early adopters. I mean, all those things that happen in the community. And um, if, if you think about it that way, marketing should own all of those seeds and should be thinking yeah. about how they are affecting every step uh, in those seeds and moving up uh, their customers, both existing and prospective customers, through each step in those phases. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I uh, definitely agree with your uh, statement that marketing should own the uh, each of the, the well, the consumer or the customer all the way through each of those steps. Next question. So what are the main arguments not to bother about accountability and measurement in marketing at all? What things should you ignore, uh, Laura? I, I don't even imagine. I can't even imagine any <laughs> marketer today, you know, <laughs> sticking their heels in and saying, I'm not going to do that. But here's the challenge. Okay, so I'm going to just kind of go back to our framework, and then, Mikhail, you can jump in because I know you maybe don't look at it this way, and that's okay. We talk about marketing okay. marketing organizations as three personas, those best-in-class marketers, which we talk about value creators, that group of uh, pretty large marketers, uh, you know, another maybe 40% uh, being sales enablers. These are the folks that really hone in on and think of themselves as in service to the sales team. They're really about the sales enablement and they're really about leads and, and the pipeline. They're very myopic in that fashion. Uh, and then you've got campaign producers, that large group and growing, sadly, group. They all use technology. They all have data. They all do reporting. But it's very, very different kinds of reporting. So to Mikhail's point earlier, the dashboards of those people look very different. The dashboards of campaign mm -hmm. producers are all about their activities. The dashboards of 
the sales enablers are clicking on their CRM system or marketing automation system and making turning that into something. Value creators have a very different kind of dashboard. So I think it's not that they're digging in their heels about reporting or measuring, but that they're not as um, the what their their proficiency in being able to communicate back to the business the difference, right? So those campaign producers, they're talking about their stuff and what their stuff is doing, how much visitors or how many downloads or uh, how many clicks or um, whatever in the, you know, that might look like. Um, maybe some outputs to registrants and of, of a webinar or stuff, right? And you got your sales enablers all talking about uh, things related to the, the, the pipeline leads generated, leads uh, accepted uh, by sales, leads that become deals, uh, conversion rates, things like that. Whereas when you look at the value creators, they're going to be talking to some of Mikhail's points about much bigger things like what are we doing around growing customer value, customer lifetime value? What is happening in the marketplace in terms of brand preference? What are we doing around share of wallet? I mean, much different kinds of measures because they're looking at the business differently. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that's a complete answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is. That's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, it seemed like uh, those people that ignore accountability and uh, measurement do that at their peril. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Laura. That was uh, great. Maybe Mikhail has a different perspective. I don't know. I mean, he talks about a lot of the, the similar ideas in the book. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's what we just uh, just discussed before. It's all about a holistic view and uh, how you can create more value for the company. And it's not just running the campaigns or in the old days, just you have your budget and you have to run the campaigns to burn the budget instead of thinking about uh, nice campaigns. I once met a, an, a client of mine and he said, we don't have a marketing budget. If the marketeers come up with a good idea and they have a fairly idea about your return on investment of this investment, I will get the money for them. And that's better than just giving them a certain budget and you have to do with it, which doesn't relate to the company goals at all. So that's a good example of how you can do it too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit more challenging that way because you can't really plan. Yeah. Uh, Definitely uh, keeps a very tight rope on what my marketing is spending and making sure that when they come up with an idea that is uh, ROI focused. On the other hand, that approach doesn't really allow for failed experiments, right? And innovation. Uh, I do think it's. I, hope, yes. I do. Yeah, think I meant it really does. Yeah, because they they have a fair idea about the return, but sometimes they're wrong. Right. Just by testing and, and trying, they're getting better on it. Yeah, and it's so better than like like exactly. sometimes you see they have they have spent the whole budget in October and in November they have a great idea, but there's no budget, and you have to wait till January, which is crazy because sometimes the opportunity is gone, and then you have to wait two months and there's no opportunity anymore. And I think that's the difference between financial management and performance management, and um, it, you know, I I was really fortunate in my corporate career, you know, my 20 year or so year corporate career to be in organizations that encourage innovation and experimentation. We had very few rules I and mean, it was OK to fail as long as it didn't do any harm either to the company or mm -hmm. to our customers. And I think that's important because you do need to learn what works and doesn't work and different segments, you know, different things resonate with different segments. And let me give you a really good example of that real quick. We had a customer uh, uh, in the technology space, very, very successful in selling to the federal government, our federal government, it's a U.S. company. And um, they wanted to sell to an, a, other entities that were kind of quasi-government that were inside mm -hmm. municipalities. And they thought it was going to be more or less the same marketing. But it turned out it was very different marketing, and they didn't mm -hmm. realize yeah. that. The federal government, they rely very heavily on very traditional kinds of approaches. Their IT organizations are very sophisticated for the most part. They rely on analysts. They go to events. They are very different, and but also quite traditional from an IT buy. 
But these municipalities uh, and what they needed, the, the, this very specific target wasn't like that. What was, you know, they were, they're a 24 seven operation. Downtime's mm -hmm. unacceptable. They had other requirements. And so what was important to them was two things, seeing others in their space using it, particularly what they call their centers of excellence. And they had like three or four yeah. cities that they thought of as centers of excellence. And if those centers of excellence had tried it and were using it, it wasn't a very hard sell. And they wanted to be mm -hmm. able to go online at any time and see it working. You know, like a real live video cam feed of watching it working, yeah. they could see it. Totally different approach. So I think again, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have known that if they hadn't done some experimentation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Experimentation is a is a is a, a big challenge in some organizations and certainly also having the not only the budget, but the management uh, uh, acceptance that sometimes the experiments are going to fail is uh, can be pretty challenging. Um, OK, so uh, last question. And um, I guess this one is uh, so what's in it for readers of this book? So, Mikhail, what are the top three takeaways that uh, you think your readers will be able to get out of this book? Well, oh, that's challenging, the top three, because I can speak hours of it. <laughs> but the first one is, if you, if you don't have a clue about accountability and why it is important, that's the first uh, thing a reader can take out of this book. The second one is, is just as Laura mentioned, is that it's about uh, the culture within your company, how you can cooperate with the other departments within your company to get the marketing accountable. It's not a, a matter of a marketing department alone. And the third one is the, the last chapter with uh, 10 easy steps to follow how to uh, work out the accountability within your company, whether you're a large company with a large marketing department or whether you're just a business owner with some people who are involved in your marketing activities. So that's the three takeaways. One is why is accountability so important? The second is the cooperation with other departments. And the third one is the 10 step to make it work in your company as well. Mm, it's fantastic. It's always good to have a roadmap and some steps that you can actually follow. So often, uh, you know, books leave that off and it's a really big plus. And I think uh, as I read the book, I thought those 10 steps really made a lot of sense as well. Uh, Laura, anything uh, anything you'd like to add to that? No, you know, thanks for writing the book I, and you really good actionable steps, even in all the chapters, not just at the end. So it was worth reading every chapter. Really good examples. Uh, at least I thought they were helpful examples. So, and I think that's important when people are reading it. Um, you know, having mm -hmm. trying to learn something is to see an example. So I thought those were also really good good things that were incorporated into the book. Yeah, they sure were. Great, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, great job, uh, Michiel. And uh, so uh, I guess that's going to conclude the interview series for the moment. Maybe as we move forward, we'll do another one or two of these. And uh, I guess for Michael, for Michiel, uh, let me thank you, uh, Laura, and uh, really enjoyed as well participating in this uh, interview series. Thank you for having me, Michiel. Guy, thanks for moderating. Great to see you both. Thank you very much, Guy, for moderating, and thanks for all your questions and uh, motivation about this, uh, Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you.